Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue the discussion on filters by looking at active filters. What sort of filters can you build while still using resistors and capacitors and what really makes the active filters different from the purely passive ones. So to start things off, the thing that makes an active filter active is the usage of some sort of amplification element. This could be a transistor, but to make life easy, it's usually an operational amplifier. This brings certain important benefits like impedance adaptation, interstage isolation, gain and adjustable Q-factor, but it also brings problems like the necessity for power supplies and limited frequency response. Now, without going into too many details, it's important to remember some of the limitations of any op-amp, since this will directly impact the performance of any filter built around it. First thing to look at is the actual range of signals that can pass through the op-amp. So the input voltage, the voltage present on the inverting and non-inverting inputs, can either be equal or slightly exceeding the supply voltage in the case of rail-to-rail -rail input op-amps, but with a regular op-amp, the voltage will usually be limited by some sort of multiple of 0.7, the forward bias voltage of a PN junction. So if you supply the amplifier with plus minus 5 volts, you might be limited to an input signal range of only plus minus 3.5. A similar situation exists with the output. You have rail-to-rail -rail output op-amps that have a very small limitation, so the output voltage range is usually the supply range minus some tiny value, so 0.1 or in that range, but with regular op-amps, you again get some multiple of 0.7. The exact voltage range, both for input and output, will of course be documented in the component's datasheet. But it's important to keep in mind that the active amplifier is usually limited in the amplitude of signals it can handle, both on the input and on the output. The other important consideration is the frequency at which the components can be used. Usually, the datasheet will mention only the unity gain bandwidth, which is the frequency at which the op-amp's open loop gain is equal to 1. But if you actually need any sort of fixed predictable gain out of your amplifier, well, the maximum usable frequency will be lower than the unity gain frequency. So taking a basic example of the NE5532, where the typical unity gain bandwidth is 10 MHz, if you want to amplify a signal's voltage by a factor of 10, so 20 decibels, then the maximum usable frequency should be 1 MHz. Sort of. See, the unity gain bandwidth has a minimum value based on how lucky you are and the exact operating conditions, so 10 MHz is just the typical value. And the other thing to observe is that the higher frequency gain limit you get from this graph is actually the minus 3 decibel point. There is no sudden corner in the gain. So to properly get the expected results under all conditions, you will want to use the op amp at somewhat lower maximum frequency than this formula would give you. Or choose a better op amp, or just limit your gain a bit. So not all op amps are created equal, and the exact performance of your filter will be highly impacted by the exact op amp that you use. With that fun bit out of the way, let's finally start looking at some actual active filter configurations. Now, one of the big problems of the passive RC filters is that in an ideal world, you want the filter to be driven by a zero ohm signal source and the load needs to be of infinite impedance. This is the only way to get zero insertion loss in the passband and the way to get the exact responses predicted by the simple formulas. But this, of course, is not realistic. So to try and get close to this, the most basic active filter is the one in which you use op amps as signal buffers. Since the output of the op amp is of relatively low impedance, usually tens or hundreds of ohms, and the input is of quite high impedance, usually in the mega ohm region, this will be the closest real circuit to the ideal version. You can even take this one step further by converting the amplifier into an amplifier, so to have a non-unity gain, this way the output will be even larger than the initial input, and you can also cascade multiple stages. So if you connect multiple RC stages one after the other, the stages will not be operating in the ideal zero input infinite output impedance region, since the impedances will be defined by the interconnecting stages. By using op-amp isolators, you are getting much closer to the ideal behavior, since all of the stages are isolated from one another. 
and thus the performance of the filter will improve. So just to highlight this, I created a basic 4 order RC low pass filter, once directly with interconnected stages and once with op amp buffers. To keep things simple, I used a universal op amp, so it's not some specific component, but rather this generic one. And well, when we run the simulation and we have a look at the results, so once at the purely passive RC filter and then the active one, we can observe that the corner frequency of the filters is far better defined for the op amp active implementation. The Q factor seems to be better. This can be understood if we remember that the Q factor is not just impacted by the individual components in the filter, but also by the interconnecting circuitry. So for the purely passive implementation, there is a lot of resistance from the previous and next stages acting in on each RC segment. Whereas in the active implementation, the impedance before is zero and after is extremely high. So the Q factor is mainly impacted by the RC circuit itself. Now, there is one more type of proper active filter that I want to look at today. One of the most well-known types of filter, the voltage controlled voltage source filter. Initially developed by Salon and Key. A particular implementation of this type of filter being the Salon Key filter. Now, although technically the filters that we looked at previously, where the amplifier is just an isolator, are still voltage controlled voltage source filters, the general circuit that we will be looking at now is a filter that uses an RC network that also takes a portion of the signal from the output of the amplifier. And the amplifier itself is a non inverting voltage source with a voltage input, hence the voltage controlled voltage source name. Now, based on the exact component ratios in the RC network, but also based on the amplifier gain, the circuit allows the adjustment not just of the corner frequencies, but also of the quality factor. The original paper by Salon and Key used vacuum tubes as amplification elements in the equivalent of the emitter follower configuration. So the amplifier gain that they used was unity. The so-called Salon Key filter is commonly the one in which the amplifier is configured to have unity gain but the more general voltage controlled voltage source filter allows for higher gain values. This however is limited depending on the exact topology since going for too large of a gain value will usually turn the filter into an oscillator. Finally, you can make all types of filters as cell and key filters. So your high pass, low pass, band pass and band stop and there are other implementations as well. So now let's try to understand the math behind some of these and try to design and simulate them. First, we can have a look at the second order high pass and low pass filters. I was able to find some formulas that describe their behavior. So based on the resistors and capacitors in the RC network, you can set the corner frequency and based on these components and the gain of the amplifier, you can also set the Q factor. It's important however to check that this value stays a positive number. Usually if the gain is too high, the Q factor will turn negative and you don't want that. Now to make life easy, a common simplification that is done is to consider the capacitors and the resistors to be of equal value, which will make the formulas much simpler and the Q factor can be adjusted only from the gain. Now another simplification that you can do is set the gain to unity and change the Q factor only based on the other components. So the exact resistor or capacitor ratio. Now we can try out these circuits in the simulator. So the initial circuit to look at has unity gain. There's no resistors around the op amp and the components have equal values. So the capacitors and the resistors are equal, giving us a Q factor of 0.5. And well, with these components, we get a corner frequency of 1.59 kilohertz. So if we look at the response of the circuit, we get a specific curve. Now, if we want to improve the Q factor, one of the things that we can do is increase the gain. So with a gain of two set with these two resistors and while leaving all of the other components the same, we should get a Q factor of one, but a gain factor of two. And if we look at the response of this circuit, we can see this bump in the response. So this is specific to circuits having a Q factor of above 0.7, but at the same time, we can see that there's also gain present in the pass band. So if this is not intended, we can also change the Q factor from the component ratios. So I prepared the circuit with the same corner frequency as before, unity gain, there's no resistors around the op amp, but the two capacitors are in one to four ratio. So if we plot out 
this final circuit, we can see that the curve looks exactly the same as the previous one, it's just that there's no gain present in the pass band. Now, if you're unsure of what the response is supposed to look like for a second order filter, you can always use the generic filter blocks. So these are found under special functions, there's all sorts of these, and well for this example, I set the corner frequency Q factor and gain the same as for our last circuit. So if we plot out this response, we can see that it's exactly the same as the response coming from our discrete circuit. So if the two responses line up, you got the math right. Next, for the band stop filter, I found two main ways of implementation based on how narrow the notch actually needs to be. So you can make a wide stop band using a combination of two separate high and low pass filters, and then sum of the output using a third op amp. This will work quite well as long as the low pass corner frequency is smaller than the high pass corner frequency. The exact design details for the two filters are the same as for the previous high and low pass filters, so I will not be going into too many details with this circuit. And to actually make a notch filter, so a narrow stop band, you have the one op amp implementation. For this circuit, I was able to find some formulas that allow changing the Q factor only from the gain. The RC network is based on the twin T notch filter, so you need a specific component ratio. It's important however to mention that the gain here needs to be below a value of 2, otherwise the Q factor goes to infinity, which it should not. And while the other extreme with this base implementation is a Q factor minimum of 0.5. So just as a quick example, I prepared the circuit with the same corner frequency as before, and we can start off by running the default simulation with a gain of 1 and a Q factor of 0.5. So if we look at this, we see the notch response appearing at 1.59 kHz. Now if we increase the gain and thus the Q factor of this, so it's the same RC network, it's just that we have a higher gain, we can observe that we are getting a sharper response, so the notch is smaller, but we are also getting gain in the pass band. Now there is one variation of the circuit that can be created to obtain any Q factor while still not changing the final response amplitude, which is to add an extra op amp into the feedback loop. So with this amplifier, we can set any gain, either above one or below one, and just adjust the Q factor from this, while still keeping the same output amplitude. So here I have a secondary gain of 0.5, giving us a Q factor of 0.33, which should give a wider notch, and I have a circuit with a gain of 1.5, which should give us a Q factor of 1. So if we look at the two responses, we can see the narrower bandwidth for the high Q factor and the wider bandwidth for the low Q factor, while still keeping the exact same pass band. Finally, with the last circuit, I used two separate filters, each having a Q factor of 1, and then added the two responses up with a final summing amplifier. So if we look at the complete result, we can see some humps appearing in the response, so this is because of the Q factor of 1, and we can also observe that the stop band region looks like a triangle shape on logarithmic scale. So this is the combination of the two individual filters. Now the other thing to mention is that the gain should be the same for both filter stages, to get a flat pass band both before and after the stop region. If this is not intended, then of course you can leave different gain values. The last type of filter to look at today is the passband filter. Now here again we have two main ways in which I found that this can be done, depending on the exact shape of the response. The first being to simply interconnect a high and low pass filter. All the same formulas to design these apply as before, with the observation that the corner frequency of the high pass needs to be lower than that of the low pass. This arrangement will work very nicely when you wish to have a relatively large pass band. The other type of arrangement that can be done is using a single operational amplifier. Here there is a specific component value ratio that needs to be used, so the capacitors need to be equal and the resistors have a specific value, and based on these components you can work out the corner frequency and the Q factor is adjusted by the gain. So with this implementation, based on the exact equation, the gain needs to be below a value of 3. Now, for the first type of bandpass, I took the base schematic of a high and low pass filter, 
So these have a gain value of 2, a Q factor of 1, and the corner frequencies are at 159Hz and 15.9kHz. And well, when we combine the two circuits, so first of all, it doesn't really matter if you have the low pass and then the high pass, so the red curve, or the high pass and then the low pass, both give the exact same results. And the second thing to observe is that the gain is adding up. So compared to the initial two signals, the signal coming from the band pass has a higher amplitude, so the signal is amplified by a total factor of 2 times 2 equaling 4. And for the other type of circuit, I prepared two versions, one in which the Q factor is increased, so to a value of 1, and this is obtained by having a larger gain, so the gain of 2, and one in which the Q factor is at 0.5 with the default gain of 1. If we look at the two responses, the higher Q factor is giving us a smaller bandwidth compared to the circuit with the smaller Q factor. So by increasing the Q factor, the passband can become smaller. Higher and higher Q factors will reduce this even more. Now, the high Q factor was obtained by increasing the gain. So if this is not really intended, the circuit can of course be modified like the band stop filter and an extra op amp can be added into the feedback line. And from that, you can control the gain to any value. That way, the main output signal will always stay at unity in reference to the input. Now, the topic of active filters is far more complex. The filters discussed today are not even all of the cell and key filters, and there are more active filter topologies out there. But that is something to be discussed another time. For now, hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you can check out. And if you want to be up to date with my latest releases, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye bye.